I've recently learned that uh, millennial skinny jeans are considered embarrassing among amongst the youth, which is something mm-hmm. like I personally don't care what a child's opinion is of my pants. Scotch. <laughs> 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 Hey everybody, welcome to episode 486 of Coffee with Butterscotch, the game dev comedy podcast, Butterscotch Shenanigans. I'm Seth and I'm the games programmer. I'm Adam and I'm the miscellaneous programmer. I'm Sam and I'm the artist. And this is a show where we talk about life, business, and working in the games industry. Today's still September 11th, 22 by 4. Before we get started, we have a warning. There's going to be profanity in this show. And we'd also like to thank our supporters over at moneygrab.bscotch.net. Thank you so much for letting us grab your money to help keep this podcast going. Yeah. Uh, and so to clarify, it's still the 11th because we just finished recording another episode, which was yeah also on the 11th. Because yeah. you probably won't be listening to it back to back, even though we're recording it back to back. Yeah. Uh, so Sam, probably at this point, if you're listening to this episode, Sam's a double dad. Yeah. Now his dad powers have doubled mm-hmm. in size. Uh, what does that mean exactly? Uh, as a dad, what what new what new capabilities do you gain? I think I as unlocked, a level two dad. Yeah, I think I unlocked jorts. Actually, uh, ooh, yeah. What about New Balance shoes? Does that do you have to have three kids for that one? That or might is that, that a, might be a yeah. That might be a level three dad thing. So I don't know if I have access to that. Yeah, I gotta check the perk chart. It's very complicated. What about uh, what about cargo shorts? Where does that fall on the? Uh, cargo shorts. I think you went all the way to shorts, but I feel like cargo shorts like is the the next step up there. You know, I think you can do that at level two. I think I think level two dads gain the cargo shorts perk. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm trying to figure out when I get the belt clip. It's not been super like the the Uh, overall documentation is not super clear as when like what level of dad you have to be to get the belt clip with your phone. I mean, well, there's different there's different dimensions. Yeah, there's back. different dimensions of dadness, right? Because there's number of kids and there's also age of kids, you mm-hmm, know? Mm-hmm. And I think I think once your kids are are teenagers, then you unlock a whole new tier of, of embarrassment specializations Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. where you can get belt clips for your phone. Uh, you're always going to wear, uh, you're always going to wear socks that go halfway up your, yep. up your calves yep. and you're always going to wear shorts no matter the weather. Yeah. And I think at that point you can also slick back your hair. I'm pretty sure. If you have any left, you know what I mean? Like yeah, at that, yeah, at that yeah, juncture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if you, and if you don't, then you can do the thing where you, you know, for some reason, refuse to shave your head, but keep growing out the hair around the sides, and you get that kind of the like fryer C-shaped fryer uh, airplane mm-hmm. pillow style haircut. You know, that's a good one. Honestly, Teens better. love it when their dads have that. Yep, have yep. that hairstyle. I, I uh, <laughs> sort of incidentally specked into into girl dad. You know, mm-hmm. it was my it was yeah. my plan to start out with, but that's sort of the spec I've ended up with. So I'm not sure. I'm also not sure what uh, particulars unlock in that domain. I've been wearing a yeah, lot of bows. Yeah, our family doesn't have much experience with that because, like, our our parents accidentally triple spec into boy into yep. boy dad and boy yep. mom, you know. Yep. So I don't know. I don't know. We'll see if anything happens mm-hmm. out of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and there's something else that you could do. And again, like this doesn't really come until until later. But when when you get to start mis uh, horribly abusing slang oh, in a yeah. way that. <laughs> In a way that you can induce maximum cringe mm-hmm. and like, I'm pretty sure. Cringe damage is the dad specialty. I'm pretty sure as far as like where they fit in the overall. Yeah. I think oh yeah. The difficulty I think of all of the embarrassment related uh, specs is that they are also, they require research time because you have, to, you have to learn what is embarrassing. Cause like, right. Like I've, I've recently learned that uh, millennial skinny jeans are considered embarrassing among amongst the youth which is something mm-hmm. like i personally don't care what a child's opinion is about what pants. do the, what do they wear? <laughs> but what do wait 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 hold on are they wear, so are they wearing baggy jeans again yeah, or are they yeah, right now my my understanding cuz like i'm not i'm not up to what the youths are up to my yeah, understanding we're in is the 90s that, right yeah we're currently in the 90s phase for for the the youth so they're wearing mm-hmm. what we used oh so they're doing jinko stuff they got yeah. like chains on their jeans big, and big jeans you know all that kind of stuff yeah. um which yeah. is not embarrassing or dumb looking at all. Nope, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but it, but it, is, it is the fun part because you get to because you're occupying that territory of like not because like why would you care again? Why would you care what a child thinks about your clothing unless it's because you're having fun? Yep. that they that they care about mm-hmm. what's going on with your clothing, and so that's yeah, where because they haven't they haven't been around long enough to understand that of how how cyclical and arbitrary fashion is. Like it, it still blows my mind how. Uh, 
how all these people who are like teenagers in their early 20s are wearing glasses that to me are like Great Depression era. <laughs> yeah. The those giant, weird the fucking giant, yeah, those giant, giant glasses. Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, and the thing is like, they do look good on some people. Yeah. Not everybody. On some right? people. But like, that's just how, that's how faces that's work. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, some things look good on some faces and some yep. things don't. So the idea of like there being like a universal, this is what's in fashion right now. It's fucking weird to me. I just think like people should just wear stuff that fits reasonably well and mm-hmm. sort of f- flatters your own your shape, p- personal features, mm-hmm. you know. And everybody else can shut the hell up about just, it. Just, just <laughs> whatever you're into. Yeah, whatever you're into. Yeah, and like, yeah, unless on. you're having fun making other people pressed about how you are dressed, yes, then yes. that's that's where you get to occupy that having fun space. And, and I think, mm-hmm. but it does require research. You got to know things like. Because then there's you know how to because, use it wrong. Yeah, because I'm on know? TikTok. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known that the kids are like, oh, those millennial skinny jeans. You know, because I don't even think of them as skinny jeans. But like, I I mostly wear millennial skinny jeans. It turns out I didn't realize that's what I was doing. It's just like, you talking about like the the ones that all of us wear that are like essentially leggings, somewhat somewhat formal. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, jeans. yeah, the ones that actually like t- tend to touch your leg more often than not as they go down. You know, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. not even necessarily like tight ones, but yeah, but not like what we wore when we were growing up where it was like as baggy as fucking humanly possible. I would like to put my my leg into a pant and never touch the side of the pant for the whole day. That's sort yeah. of, that's the well, only it, part like, that touches here's me the thing. the waist. That's it. Here's the thing. They need to appreciate that some of us just are, are caked up and we don't have a choice, <laughs> okay? Uh, Seth can't that, get jeans big enough. I know? can't get... I can't get jeans that my legs and butt <laughs> fit into uh, with room to spare. Yeah. So you know he, he has to stand <laughs> with his legs in a V because his legs can't even mm-hmm. go straight because the muscles are too big. I yeah. had to learn so to do the splits just to keep my thighs from touching. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so he's got no choice in the matter. And no one's, you know, no one should be harassing him about it. So at least leave him out of it, Gen Z, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And if you yeah. got a problem, um, well, yeah, I guess that's your problem. Yeah, because I, <laughs> I don't actually give a shit. <laughs> there, there is that weird, and it's like because we're not like we're not old yet, but we're not we're like we're approaching middle age, you know. But there's this weird phenomenon that I see. Like, we're twice as old as these youngsters. Yeah, but I, I see this on TikTok. It's like all these people, basically our age, um, who are like, well, they'll do a stitch of like some literal child, like making fun of something about millennials or like talking about talking about something as if it's old, like being like, oh, I don't know what a phone book is, like that kind of stuff. And they're just mm-hmm. like their immediate response is like this look of a horror of like realization of how old they are. And I'm like, mm-hmm. this is fine. <laughs> this is completely yeah, fine. fine. Things change. Get over it. Things <laughs> change. I knew I knew I had actually entered the old class when someone I met was like, oh, what's your you know, we were about to head different ways or something. And they're like, what's your Instagram? And I was like, what? Yeah. Why? And they were like so you keep in touch. And I was like, you don't have a phone? We have f- used a phone. To- and they were like, I don't, oh, I just don't have an email? Instagram. And I was like, yeah. I will say though, what? to me, that's <laughs> that's partially age, but also like, like I had a GDC, I think one of my GDC, when I first mm-hmm. GDC talks, which was now like eight or nine years ago when I was in my 20s. Uh, at the end of my talk, I was like, here's my email address. Don't try to tweet at me. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not using yeah. that crap, right? Uh, because like, you gotta, like, there are trends, but just because you drew the line somewhere or something that you're not going to engage with doesn't necessarily mean that you're old. It just means you're discerning, you know. But it can. Sounds like, like, it sounds like the thing an old wise person yeah, would say. Yeah, it can you just I mean? be both, you know? Like, yeah. I, I think to me that's the thing is, like, it's just fine if people – at different points in their lives, kind of as a cohort, are just into different stuff. You know? Listen, like, all I know is that I can fucking fun. I can type and Gen Z can't. So I don't care. You know what? Don't care. I don't care about whatever. Yeah. Apparently. They can't can, yeah. teach they can't they, uh, touch. But when I, but when I see they, they shit on those phones though, I'm like, I can't. My thumbs. Yeah, look at that, that thumb dexterity is something else. You know, like if I'm, if I'm trying to type with my thumbs at a certain point, I just turn the phone off and <laughs> I, just, I just get back to a keyboard. Yeah. I'm like, you know, 120 <laughs> words per minute, no problem, right? Yep. Uh, but man, those that thumb typing is a whole other dimension of ass pain. Yes. Yeah. So no thanks. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyways, let's. Uh, we're just gonna get into some questions because, like we mentioned earlier, this is a we're recording this right on the heels of the double hand episode. Uh, uh, on account of Sam uh, becoming a double dad. And so we're just going to get right into it. So Let's go. these questions come from our listeners over at podcast.bscotch.net. The highest upvoted question comes from Chelosis, who says, how mm. do you get into the zone for working? Ooh, that's an interesting question. What do you guys uh, do? What, I guess 
tell me about your your like imagined optimal morning versus what it typically actually is. My so imagined optimal morning is not what I've gotten to experience for a long time because of the ADHD medication shortages. But all <laughs> well, I'll kick it off that way as if that because it's still basically the same. It's just less effective, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but for for me, it's basically like I gotta have my stimulants, which is always coffee, and then if I'm lucky and can get meds, then also ADHD meds, right? But it's like get out of bed slowly and horribly. <laughs> This is my optimal morning. Get out of bed slowly and horribly because I'm not a morning person. That's just the worst. Like it takes me so long for my brain to come alive. Get all right, now hold on. Before you go any further, <laughs> for some reason I have because all right, I just thought of this ADHD. Anyways, uh, I saw somebody get asked the question: If you woke up and discovered that you were the opposite sex, just just as soon as you woke up, what's the first thing you would do? I and all I could screaming. think was, all I could think was pee. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, be that's like, the uh, first thing I do, no like matter what. You'd probably be like, right? oh, "I got to deal with this later because I got to do my daily." But I got to brush my teeth. I got to shower. I, you know, I got to this. I know, can't deal changes. with anything right when I wake up. <laughs> anything at all. So if something even, happened, even your optimal your optimal day includes not dealing with anything. When yeah, you I can't. Up. So like, yeah, <laughs> if my if I was suddenly in a different body or whatever, I'd just be like, right. "Yeah, I'm going to have to deal with this once." I'll I have, deal with this later. <laughs> once I've had coffee, once I've peed, once I've had some water, you know. Gotta hate those bodies swaps yeah it's just so then, then i'll figure that out at that point but mm-hmm. yeah so it's so it's uh, it's basically like the first part of my day is trying to fucking just come to life and get my brain going and so it's all about it's like stimulants going through the routine getting everything getting cleaned up so i feel like a human being putting clothes on so i feel like a human being right it's like so i have to like really start to feel like a person before i can like settle in and do a thing and a lot of that is sort of Getting away from being a sleeping, uh, hmm. oozing biological entity. A mass. You know, you, a is mass. There, is, before you go to the computer, is there is part of that becoming coming online thing happening while you are already at the machine? No, it used machine? to before I had to deal with like cat chores in the morning and stuff too, and like playing with cats and getting them fed mm-hmm. and all of that. Because then I then I used to my routine used to be like get coffee, go to my computer, and like wake up by checking email and drinking coffee. You know. I think. Mm-hmm. Kind of getting stuff going that way. Um, these days now, I kind of like have to do just more morning chore stuff before I can sit down. So by then, I've already had my cup of coffee. Might have a second one already on hand, you know. So you're pretty, uh, you're pretty, uh, you're pretty alert by the time you strap in. Yeah, as far as like my brain allows, you know, it's like by the time I'm at my desk, I'm I'm ready to be fully engaged with the system and. And then it's a matter of like easing myself into the stuff and trying to figure out what, especially these days, because my work is so scattered among like programming related tasks, Mm -hmm. marketing tasks, biz dev tasks, uh, it's just all over the place. And so a lot of us trying to figure out how do I, how do I knock out the stuff I don't want to do? Because even though the mornings are horrible and I hate them, that's also when I have the most like motivation once I Mm -hmm. I do turn on. So I try to knock out all the stuff I don't want to do. So So the hard stuff. To, to it's not hard it's just, stuff. It's stuff you just. Well, like, it's God damn it. Stuff you'd rather not have looming over you for the whole fucking yeah, day, yeah, so that yeah, you yeah, don't yeah. have to think about. Yeah. It. Yeah. It's, it's gotcha. stuff that's okay. hard. Not be. It's stuff that's hard for me to do because of how my brain is. Right. So it's like mm-hmm. the stuff. Basically, if things are really hard to me, if I don't want to do them, otherwise I just do them. Mm-hmm. Hard or not, yeah, it's fair. not really yeah, an yeah. applicable metric. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So yeah. like, so for that most interesting framing. Yeah, nothing's really hard. Some things are just annoying to have to do. And <laughs> well, that is, is I hard. think it is an interesting <laughs> question because uh, it's something also like my wife talks about on occasion is when she was back in her med school residency, she would talk to med students who were coming in. Like one of the questions they would always ask is like, "Oh, is it really hard? You know, to be in residency?" And her mm-hmm. response was always like, "Well, what do you mean? Because like you're working a lot, like a a lot, right? Mm-hmm. And you're learning stuff constantly. You're dealing with all those like complicated social scenarios, right? So like, by most definitions, obviously yes. Like there's not such there's no such thing as like easy practice of medicine, right? But when she thinks about it, but compared she to what well, exactly? Because she doesn't think about it as hard, you know. Because mm-hmm. like I know that like our like our dad who who recently retired from a career as a as a surgeon. Like to him, taking out an appendix was the easiest fucking thing in the world. Yeah, like he could do no it with his eyes problem. closed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and like and and also like the the training to get there took a lot of time. But I've never really heard him describe it as hard. Yeah, but that was also it's just, it's while just, you just working have to his ass it, off you know? and like yeah. So yeah, so it's an interesting question of like what does it mean for things to be and for me like hard is basically overcoming. It's 
It's about overcoming some kind of an obstacle. But to me, the biggest obstacle is always the willingness to do the thing, yeah. whatever it is. It's, the, it's just how hard is it to yoke yourself to the task, basically. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Like, that's yeah. the thing yeah. that I... And especially with ADHD. That's it's kind weird. It's kind of like definitionally what ADHD is, right? It's like... Yeah, I get that. I think it's, I'm in the same place. Yeah. So like most of the stuff that I'm doing these days is what I think of as hard, which is interacting with people to accomplish some goal, right? Or trying to like create some prose to accomplish some sociological goal of like marketing mm-hmm. or whatever, right? Or or to convey something to a business partner or whatever. Uh, to me, like all oh, those are hard because I don't want to do them. And, uh, and so I have to like make myself fucking do it and the mornings are the best time to do that. Just like sit down, try to like, and and it's all about like, I get my music on, get my earbuds in, like there's the whole ritual of getting everything settled. And then, uh, I just like the way that I have my computer set up is like, I've got a few different versions of my browser with different tabs and like tab groups and stuff. So I could go to the right set, got all my stuff right there go to my email inbox and just start work, just start doing stuff. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. And, uh, and these days we have our, you know, our new uh, work management tool. So like I can uh, start with that thing and figure out, mm-hmm. figure out what's, what's on takes the takes out a lot of know? the prep time. It does. Yeah. And so, so, so I still have to do like all the admin stuff first. Cause I don't really document that. Cause it's just like, this is shit I do every morning. It's like check email and figure out what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. So I knock all that stuff out and do my best to get into the swing of it Mm -hmm. while I'm doing it. And for that kind of stuff or stuff that I don't want to do, it's either extremely helpful or extremely unhelpful to have other people be visible. So I kind of choose in the moment. Do I like, for some reason, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my, my brain is for some reason, like really about this idea of like, trying to figure out what it means for something to be hard. Cause the more I think about it, (laughs) yeah, the more, the more I can't figure it out. Well, it's because I think that the reality is that if something is engaging to you, then it, even if it is a challenging thing, right, mm-hmm. it's complicated, it's got a lot of, it has a lot of requirements on you, whatever else. If it is engaging to you, it doesn't really matter that it yeah. is challenging. Because to me, but, uh, but the to me thing if is, I don't know how to do a thing, because I, th- I think for like programming as a discipline, the thing that you would like kind of think of as hard is like not knowing how to approach a problem or it just being really complicated. So you have to think a lot about all the components, right? Um, so there's a lot of like effort involved, like kind of a, but for both is of those. hard or is that just well, the, the thing steps is like, that is, you're going through? I you think know? when people yeah. describe programming as hard or really like any discipline, they're typically referring to like the practice of actually doing it, like the elements that are involved, it's, not knowing what to do, figuring out what to do, putting in the effort to then get it done, right? Um, yeah. But that is definitely not how I think of art. For me, like, that's what makes those things fun and interesting is, like, trying to figure that stuff out. And sometimes, sometimes I end up in a part of the discipline where I'm so uncertain about what to do and can't get a hold on it that it starts mm-hmm. to move back into hard territory. Because yeah. now – but it's because it's hard because I don't want to do it anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's or the you part. Can't, yeah. Or you well, can't that's, figure that's, out That's what I'm how. kind of sticking on where it's like – at, at the end of the day, the thing just is what it is. So like, like one of the things that people struggle with the most is, you know, something like getting in shape or losing weight. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I, you know, I can't help but reflect on like, if you take an animal to the vet and the animal's overweight, you know, and the vet's like, yeah, feed him less. And then that, that, that solves the, that solves the problem. It's, it's very simple. Right. And it's, and it's not hard for you to have your dog lose weight because it's not about motivation or, mm-hmm anything like that. It's like, it's just a, it's just a one step process. Right. And it's <laughs> still, the dog it less. still can be because a lot of people get a lot of joy out of getting to feed their pets. Right. Because it's mm-hmm. watching a pet be fucking into the, like the food they're giving them is very That's fun best. and satisfying. It makes you feel good to give that experience to the, yeah. you know, so but it's an interesting that framing of, of how like the, like, like, let's say, let's say I wanted to be able to like squat 600 pounds. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so I'd be like, well, like, that's going to be really hard to do. I'd be like, well, what does that mean exactly? Because I can think of like a hundred different ways to, to get there. Uh, I, I don't think I would because it just would be, a, I don't, I don't want to put in that time. Right? I think it's easy to confuse simple, simple versus complicated with hard versus easy. Right. And I think that's yeah. kind of what happens in these contexts. Cause like a lot of things are actually, yeah, they're but very it's weird simple, because it's, because it's not the hard. thing that's hard. No, no, no. It's the doing right? of the thing that is hard. It's, it's all internal. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not even about what you're capable of in terms of like, uh, like, like you can't, like anybody's capable of like getting up and going to the, go to the gym or like mm-hmm. change, changing their diet or learning to program or whatever, uh, in the right structure. Right. Like if, if, if like you go into like a programming boot camp for a month and you have nothing else to do, 
right? Like you're, you're going to learn, you're going to learn how to program. Uh, but as soon as you have to then like balance that against a million other things and, and continuously make active decisions on how to yeah. pursue that goal, mm-hmm. then it's like the, the, the like learning programming in and of itself is not hard. It's, it's, it's creating the structure and doing giving yourself the, the time. Yeah. It's doing it in a, in a context that doesn't care about the fact that you're trying to do that. That's often. And actually this is the same feeling I've had about, uh, about parenting is actually what you're, you're talking about. It's like to me, like having any of the individual pieces, you're like, yeah, that's, yeah, that's hanging out. Yeah. Hanging right? out with the kid, <laughs> like all of it, like change of diapers, all this stuff, all of it is, it's straightforward. Right. Or there's, you can look up tons of resources on it. Um, and what's, but what's challenging about it is, is the, fact it's that it's balanced it's, it's balanced yeah. it's not the, it's not the only yeah. thing you're doing and so it's like but yeah so that's weird right because it's it's not that it's not that the, it's not that parenting is hard is that parenting is hard when you have a million other things going on because it turns out well, doing a million things is just, hard <laughs> but also just like and when you're tired right or yes. like whatever there's there's a million yeah. reasons why uh, in the moment the thing becomes hard which again to me like the way i think of hard versus easy is can i basically just go do it right or do i have to Get somehow make myself do yes, it. Yes. Uh, and is that even possible? Right. Uh, but like, would you, would you describe in retrospect, like, is it hot? Was it hard to, to build rumpus? Uh, I wouldn't have described it that way. No. Yeah. But like, it, at it any was given, a, at any it was given a lot moment. of work and a lot of challenge as an ob- challenge in the sense of like obstacles I had to overcome to figure it out. Right. Yeah. Uh, and at a given moment, uh, when it got particularly challenging, it would move in into the hard, the hard territory mm-hmm. where I'd have trouble making myself do it. Like, like there, there the were whole, hard parts of it, but also like those were expected, you know, and, and like you just needed to put the time in. Yeah, but, but when a thing is hard versus yeah. when it isn't also is like – so it's like right now because I've been without ADHD meds for like two years. Right, I was only I only got to be on them for a year and a half for the fucking shortage uh, and now I've been off of them, right? And so, so right now, everything is harder by like, by my definition, just literally mm-hmm. everything. Right. But especially the stuff I don't want to do, because that's like the whole value of ADHD meds is they move things that are hard and they move them from hard to less harder to easy territory. Right. Yeah. Um, but again, it's not the task itself. That's hard. The task it's stays the same. Doing it. Doing Engaging it. Yes. with the task, yeah, exactly. the task becomes easier. easier. Yeah. So yeah. I think, cause, and this is why I like that question of like, oh, was it hard to do X? It's like, well. Not inherently, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just sitting there. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and yeah. it just needs the time. Well, I mean, you just need to give it the time. So you said you get, you basically, the way you start your work is by front loading the things that would have the highest, uh, the hard things, the hard things. Right? <laughs> front loading those hard things. Cause I actually, I literally take the opposite approach typically where I usually, I think my, the best work days I have are typically where I have one or two things loaded up that are small scale. Mm-hmm. Mine's usually, my problem is typically a scale problem for where I'm at in uh, like our overall, the work that I tend to do, which is just that most of the things I do just are very, they just take a fucking long time. And so that's what's hard yeah. about it. They are hard to do because they just take days. It's like and making a new thing, animating it, fully integrating it, adding components to it, whatever else. It just takes days before it's all done. And that's what I find hard about it is the fact that I can't, it's not like I finished my morning and I'm like, I did it. I finished my morning and I'm like, I got some percentage of the way done. And I, I don't fucking know. You know, yeah, but again, um, it's weird because like, it's because it's not that like it's hard. It's not that the, you would describe any of those pieces hard as hard. It's just that it it takes so long that doing it in a way that feels like you're being like good with your time, yes, that you're not like mentally d- disengaging from it or getting distracted, like that. That's the hard part, which yeah. is that's where I'm like it's so the interesting, right? Is to think that like, yeah. well, that, like because you're no, missing no, the tight feedback loop, right? Yeah, yeah. And, like very few tasks are just like hard on their own. It's like your brain trying to latch onto it. That's the hard part. Yeah. Well, this is why for like really ADHD, weird. <laughs> this is why for like ADHD brains being able to break up large things into small things is like so helpful because it's helpful for everybody, obviously, right? But but for ADHD brains in particular, there's a reason why that's like one of the core pieces of advice is like, but also like ADHD brains aren't very good at it because you first have to engage with that task, which yep. is hard because you're looking at an ambiguous big thing and being like, all right, I'm going to go break this into chunks, right? Again, it's not difficult necessarily. It can be depending on the task, but like it's not inherently difficult or challenging to do that necessarily, mm-hmm. but it's almost always hard because mm-hmm. of that layer of abstraction where there's not like a nice tight feedback loop because ADHD yeah. brain, brains love that tight feedback, which is, and that's why I love programming so much and why, and like Sam, to your point of like, 
the distance between working mm-hmm. on a thing and getting an outcome. Uh, like that's what makes all the other stuff. That's what makes like even more so with like the writing stuff than like the fact that I'm engaging in a different medium, the medium of like prose and like thinking of somebody else as a social being and trying to like create some kind of a interaction and consequence with them. Right. Mm -hmm. But a lot of why that's so challenging is because there's kind of, isn't a feedback loop, right? There's like, there's yeah. edit a thing that I want to send and think about it as I'm doing it until I kind of polish it up and get to something that I'm like, okay, yeah, I think this gets the job done. And then, and that's what that process is. But there's, there was never an answer at any point about mm-hmm. like, is this good? Does this accomplish the task? And then downstream, once I send something off, like whether or not it does accomplish the task is usually really ambiguous, mm-hmm. you know, uh, versus programming is like, I can sit down with a really hard programming problem really challenging programming problem, uh, just to keep the to keep those words straight, uh, and make almost no progress towards it, but still have written a function that works and written mm-hmm. a test for that function. And I can start like working towards that solution. Yeah, you can feel ways the completeness. Where, yeah, I'm like feeling a completeness meter go up. And so I still get to engage with it in that way that satisfies yeah. like my need for that feedback loop. Uh, and also yeah, sense. breaking apart. And this is also why like the first part of any big project that I have to do is like the the philosoph- philosophical part of being like, what even am I trying to do? And that one is also always hard for me mm-hmm. because it's engaging again with it at this like, it's, it's like a to-do list. It's like breaking apart the big task into small tasks where everything is a question mark and where there's no such thing as a real feedback loop. Mm-hmm. Well, because there's no answer. Because there's no answer. Exactly. Every, everything is fuzzy. There's no like, answer and the output is not concrete, right? So yeah. – uh, so those are the things that I find hard. They don't mesh well with my brain. I think for any person finding something hard, it's going to be some combination of circumstance and how their brain works mm-hmm. and how those things interact with the thing that you're trying to do. That's collectively what makes the thing hard, right? right. So for me, it's like if I get the hard stuff done, if I don't well, get the hard stuff want, done, it's, it's how you start. Yeah, yeah, you want to start with that so you can be done with it. Yeah, that, because it doesn't yeah. cost me anything to do the rest. Like I can just sit down and do it. But the cost I have there is a switching cost, which is if I get into the stuff that isn't hard, then my brain starts to like go f- more and more like focused on it. Oh, you're not going back. You know? I'm not going I back. I can't. Which why for me, it's stuff. like, yeah. yeah, so I treat like the, the latter part of the day as like the latter part of the day is the open rest of the day. If I like, if I end up <laughs> deciding to work until eight, that's fine because I'm just like in it and I'll work until eight or whatever. There's nothing, there's not something stopping me, right? I get to just go. You just go. But I can't do that if there's something else that has to be done that I don't want to do. And I sure as shit can't switch off of it to like go do that stuff. So it's not, it's not even that I like, it's necessarily that I want to do the hard stuff first that that's actually helpful. It's that that's the only, that's the you only way I can do it. Yeah. I think why I, I have a similar approach. I think on the, well, again, the optimal thing is kind of like it's the, I'd say it's the usual, you know, get up, you do your, like, I don't know, take care of yourself, basically, eat some food. Uh, in my case, take care of baby, hang out baby, um, typically for, you know, half hour, hour, doing naked breakfast, all that stuff. Then I settle in to work, and the thing is, depending on the day, then, like, my mind, so I mean, you're saying, like, you basically sit, you sit, you sit in when you're ready. But I sit in sometimes when I'm just, like, still a semi-transparent ooze, you know, so it's like, depending on the day and everything that's been going on, then I feel like I have quite a bit of wobble on like exactly how the morning starts. I would say the tasks I do when I actually, when I actually like begin, almost always follow the same pattern, which is either, like you said, kind of a a combination of like, let me get this shit out of the way. Like these things, no matter how big they are, which gets shit out of the way. Or stuff that would loom, right? Yeah. Stuff that would loom. Stuff that would loom. Yep. Um, Or, if, uh, especially at certain times, depending on like what we're working on, if it would be extra beneficial for me to have a little bit of extra, like, uh, completed, solidly completed things in the pipe, just because of whatever we're doing, then that's where I pick like a small thing that I can accomplish in less than an hour. Yeah. So that by essentially, if I can, if by 10, 30 or 11, if I have already completed something and all my looming shit is gone, then I'm like, yes. Yeah. Now you, know, you got the rest of the day. You can yep. just... Yep. And then, yeah, from my, from essentially 11 on, then it's, that's like the, whatever the thing is that I'm working on currently. And usually it's like a thing for me because I, again, like they take just a long time to do. Um, and similarly, I just kind of sit down in the morning and, and look at, I look at our internal work tool. I look at the calendar. I look at, and then I just think for a second about like what the fuck we're doing and try to come up with that short list, right, of uh, stuff to work on. So Yep. On days that are more slippery than like that morning's just more slippery where it's like I might just like read for like 20 minutes and then and then finally my brain's like it's time and I'm like yes and then I go right I might just be I might go for a walk until 930 or something because 
Yeah. I'm just not there yet. There's no point in me just it's the it's the hard I'm I'm avoiding the hard part, which is yoking yourself to the desk in the case of like yeah. for me in the morning. But yeah, my uh, is I don't I don't try to like like these days my start time is like somewhere between nine AM and ten thirty AM, right? <laughs> and my end time is then just basically eight hours later. I just like work until because like my goal is basically like make sure I'm putting in sufficient time to like mm-hmm. work towards all my projects. But but when that time but happens, when it starts yeah. and how soon exactly <laughs> I don't I just like I don't really worry about you know I just it's yeah, the same I may work from like, super early sometime I may work from like six o'clock to well usually like about nine thirty or so probably late as yeah. I get started yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot of the team is basically like shifted from my time by like two hours right on both mm-hmm. sides uh, and it's just like it's I basically I've made it so that I can work when my brain is most likely to be able to accomplish things so that because otherwise it's like. Otherwise, what's the point? You're just sitting there mm-hmm. doing nothing, accomplishing mm-hmm. nothing and being feeling like shit about it, you know? So uh, so I'd rather just, and of course, this is because we have the flexibility of deciding when we work and all this kind of stuff. Um, in historical context where I had less flexibility, it was just like, I, mean, I, would, I would just do the job poorly for a while until my brain, <laughs> until my brain came online because that's what you're being forced to do, you know? Seth, yeah. you're a little more even, aren't you? On like your start and stuff. Like yeah. You're better I, being regimented than... I try to maintain a pretty consistent routine. So like my, my work day typically starts between 8.30 and 8.40. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, right around there. But I go, I go like to try to, to try to kind of get the most out of my time. I, I do a lot of chunking. So it's in like, I get, like first thing, like when I get to my computer, I look at my email inboxes Usually just delete everything, <laughs> what I do. and then I'm and then I'm done. Yeah. I do I do not look at my email until the next day mm-hmm. um, because I'm done with it now. And what I found is, and which I'm sure you guys can also agree with, uh, the more emails you reply to, the faster you get more emails. That's the worst, mm-hmm. you know. And so anything that's not urgent, I try to you know give it some breathing room mm-hmm. and re- only reply to stuff as needed. Um, but yeah, f- for me, it's mostly about like. Get admin stuff out of the way, figure out the plan for the day. So I'll go into Blork, onto our, our work management tool, get a sense of where I'm at, what's going on. Uh, and then I'll just try to formulate a plan to to try to chunk things out. I, I have found, though, that that um, working from home has been a bit of a challenge for me, I think maybe more than s- some of the other folks on the team. Um, because I, I, I get, a, I get so much like joy and satisfaction out of the collaborative aspects of working on stuff. And because we have like more flexible work hours and, and, you know, some people are like not even around until, you know, a couple hours after, after I start my day or, you know, people are take like, we don't, we don't have like a fixed lunch break time or anything like that. Right. And so there's a lot more asynchronous communication that happens, um, Nowadays, compared to like back when we were in the office, and somebody would just be like, "Hey, look at this! Do you see this?" You know, you just like turn your head and be like, "Yeah, mm-hmm. it looks good." <laughs> uh, and so that has that has been something that I've just kind of always been kind of grappling with since COVID of trying to find things that I can do that won't require me to like get feedback from people and trying to keep other people's like schedules and availability into account for me. Like that's kind of the the hardest part of finding ways to chunk out time and like get into the zone. Um, and, and especially kind of as, as time has passed as, as different people's schedules have become more unpredictable because of a variety of things. Right. Um, then that, that can kind of like make things a little more difficult, mm-hmm. but overall it's still like, pr- it's still pretty manageable, you know? Um, but yeah. So like for me, it's, it's mostly just about trying to find those, trying to find chunks and just like fit, like find a thing that'll fit nicely into that chunk. You know, like, like Sam was saying, like, oh, I got an hour here uh, where I'm like, I've got a good, a good hour that I can just lock in and do something. Let me find something that I think will take me about an hour, right? Grab that thing and just don't worry about anything else and just bang out that thing and, and get it done. Right. Yeah. I think um, it's so much that depends on like what kind of work you have available to you and how long those things take. And yeah, that's, that, that's been yeah, a, the funny one we're talking yeah. about stuff. Cause like mine yeah. is, it's just not easy to measure the, I don't have anything where I'm like, that's going to take, I do actually, they're, they're just singular art, bits like a component for something, you yeah. know, like a single picture. I'm like, Oh, I'll take about an hour, an hour and a half maybe. But yeah. anything else, I could not. There's no chunk of appropriate size for me to fit it into. Yeah. So it's yeah. kind of well, it's all it's all guesswork, you know. Like if I get a, if I get a bug from QA, right, and I look at it, I'm like, I, mean, I think I know what's going on there. Probably take me 20 minutes, you know. And then as I start digging into it, then you know the the horror starts to mm-hmm. dawn on me of like, oh, this is actually like a four hour yeah, like a refactor. 
Uh, and those are those are the parts where I do. Fu- those are the moments where I do find myself kind of like losing the plot. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> where I'll be like, okay, well, like now I've spent twenty minutes of you know maybe it's like it was an hour until lunch when I started this thing. Twenty minutes in, I'm realizing this is going to be a whole day project mm-hmm. now, uh, and now I got to reorient. Be like, okay, do I abandon this and then try to find like a s- even smaller thing to do and squeeze in, or do you know? Uh, those are the those are the times where things can kind of fly off the rails because yeah. um, you never really know exactly what you're getting into. And mm-hmm. I, like now, like I'm usually pretty good about it, but you know, every now and then you kind of just uh, run up against. Yeah, well, and, there, like that. and so much that is about context switching, you know, because like because for for all of my stuff, I have tons of things of varying scope of size that I could be doing at a given moment, but they're distributed across incredibly different projects and. And even like domains, so like, you know, marketing PR biz dev stuff versus various programming things, right? But for my programming things, there's like a whole bunch of different whole discrete kinds of projects that I have. Uh, and the amount of context which I'm required to move between those adds to that hardness layer, right? So like, mm-hmm. so so I don't I don't use time as a metric to figure out like, oh, let me go find something to fill in this space um, because there's so much mental overhead cost of picking a thing that isn't already what I'm working on. But the thing that I'm working on usually just has a bunch of big stuff I have to be dealing with um, so that I can't really be making those choices. Yeah. And that, that's, that to me, that's kind of part of the chunking idea, which is like, I, I don't want to have a day where, where I'm doing like half the day administrative stuff and meetings and the other half programming, or like, I don't want to be uh, like working on like making content and quests in Crashlands 2 and then pivot over to like RAM optimizations or something because like each of those things is such a requires such a discrete batch of working memory that it just takes a while to like build up to get to that point and you want to stay in that zone as long as you can so yeah, yeah. so I try to do things like just in in those stay in your bucket you know pick a bucket for the day and stay in the bucket as much yeah. as possible yeah I, I think it's as much as you can yeah it's when you can't like the, to me that's when the hardest part comes in is it's not, it's not even when you can't because like of a thing that I have to do or something, but even just like, I mean, so, cause like I'll have like a project where it's like this feature sometimes. Yeah. It's like, well, this feature just ended up taking like a couple of hours. So I can knock that feature out. The next feature is going to take like a couple of days. Right. And so I'm at the tail end of the day. I did the, like the other things mm-hmm. and my choices are like, get started on the next big thing, but like it's now it feels blooming. It has become hard, you know? And so then I just feel like the only move is to switch and do something else. But then the things that I have left are like so different or the amount of time required is so huge or so small or whatever. It's that, true, like that's the, when it becomes the, hard. You know? Yeah. Cause what you guys are talking about is like uh, you're able to batch work in a context, right? Where it's like, I'm doing programming on the game. Or like I'm doing content for the game. Or else. Yeah. Not necessarily able to, but try to. Try to, yeah. You know, because like oftentimes I'll be working oh, on content I, and then I'll be like, oh, yeah, I can't do this because there's a programming thing that Yeah, yeah, but, but I mean, yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, you, you're talking about like there's a, the, the work itself is like naturally self-bucketed oftentimes, right? Fully. It's mm-hmm. nicely encapsulated in some way. Because like what's interesting about the, the challenge that I've had with this is that on the art side is that the art, we make the art and then you go animate it. And then you put that into the game and you hooked it up to the, the game changer and then you go test it in the game. And so you're actually not, I'm not doing art all day. Like the reason it takes a long time is because it's like, it's a combination of, you're doing this three different contexts between the art creation and the animation of that art. Uh, and then like all the technical setup for it and the testing of it. And then all of them spill back onto themselves. Well, it kind of depends how you're framing, how you're framing your, your buckets, right? Because... Well, it's a very different it, task. Like doing the art is very it, it different is. than animating is kind of what I'm getting to. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, if, but if you're thinking about it as like uh, like making this asset as like the the task when actually it's like four really discrete and completely different yeah. sequential kind of subtasks that you can't really very easily uh, move back and forth between, right? Mm-hmm. Um, then I think you could – and I don't think you do this, but I think like – if somebody sort of like tells themselves like I'm just doing one thing right, but but it's actually like oh, yeah, fifty no. things, but it's very easy to like kind of uh, get into a weird headspace because mm-hmm. you've convinced yourself that what you're doing is one thing, and because it's one thing, it shouldn't take that long, and it and it should be kind of easy, right? And then 
of course, it's not one thing and it's actually fucking hard. And yeah. then you get well, really like, discouraged. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah I, don't, I don't have much of a discourage, the discouraging yeah. problem, but I think it's, it's yeah, mainly you just, just kind of plow ahead. You know, yeah, I just got to keep working on it. It's mainly yeah. just that. But it is uh, part of it because it's, it's the same idea. Because like, basically what you're saying is that in order for you to accomplish certain, like your main kind of discrete tasks, right, mm -hmm. uh, that you have to go through a pipeline, basically a series yeah, of steps. Yeah, it's a whole pipeline. Right? But each one of those series of steps has a different level of hardness to it. And you also have context switching on top of that. And anyway, hardness for the sense of like what it means for you to go approach that. Because I think it's like it's for certain of my – programming projects the like design part can f can be pretty distinct from mm -hmm. the programming part and then others are kind of the same and like the testing part can be like the same as the programming part but sometimes mm -hmm. they're really different and depending on the relationship between all of these things moving between them has these very different levels of of hardness and so like so when i go to work on say like rumpus or big web backend stuff which is just a huge legacy project you know and Every part of the pipeline related to it, deploying it, testing it, getting it, just getting it running locally, trying to figure out what it's going. Like every single one of those has that same kind of vibe that Sam you're talking mm -hmm. about where it's right. like each it's step is its own kind thing. of thing and it's like and yeah. all of it is hard. And and I, and I do – I find myself very avoidant of like the project, not because – the thing that I'm quote unquote doing there, programming is hard, but because the net experience of like mm. causing a change that I need to happen to happen, right? Which isn't just programming in the same way mm -hmm. that like for you, it's not just making art. It's getting it into the game. Yeah. Well, it's, well, think, it's the integration problem. It's the integration. Right? Yeah. 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 But I think what's interesting about that too, though, is that like this is – it's actually better than it – which is what we would say. It's way better than it used to be because it used to be that I, I would just make the art, right? But then – have to wait six months sometime yeah, before like period. we hit a point where we put it in and then it's like, Oh, here's some feedback on it. So like, so the reality is like what we've done is we've, we've closed the loop on it. So it's a self-contained loop now where like I can do the whole thing. Right. But that means then that creating the asset from start to finish is actually working through these like very different modes of. Well, it's, it's actually in a weird way. Like we've, uh, cause we used to have things more batched by domain where like yes. I was the integration guy. If something was going to get hooked up to stuff in the game, literally that, had to go it, it, that's what I did, right? And and Sam would make the art, and he mm -hmm. and he could make art so fucking fast that he would just do like asset after asset after asset. But that's all you're doing. It's not very hard yeah, to do. And it's know? and it's yeah, and a big part of that is because without that context switching into different modes of working and having to like think like take that asset and deliver it the whole way through the pipeline yourself, then uh, you were able to to much more rapidly just do the the art part because you didn't have to constantly yeah, think like about it. change yeah. how your brain works every 20 minutes, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which is also why, you know, if you think about, there's this, there's this weird thing that happens, like you can see like in a larger company, they want to try to take advantage of this with, with people specializing in stuff, right? Like you'll so have like an a, animator, you know, animator, 3D modeler, <laughs> example, yeah. rig, rigger, texture mm -hmm. artist, you know, concept artist, uh, and trying, trying to kind of get those economies of scale by saying like, look, if I've got, you know, 10 people, in my 3D modeling department, and all they do is make 3D models, then they're going to get like real, real yeah. fast at making 3D do. models. Yeah. And they do, except, except somebody's got to convey information to them about what those models yep. need to have. Those models need to then be handed off to other teams and then come back for feedback and revisions. There needs to be project managers to mediate all the communication. And it turns out that uh, it's it's easier for them because they're just doing one type of thing, but it's not really faster overall for the organization as a whole mm -hmm. to have but people specialize like that. Yeah, from, <laughs> yeah, from an organization standpoint, it's also just a lot more difficult to find people who it's, – it's the full stack concept, right? Like, like in, yeah. in web dev, it's a very clear concept, but the same concept is in any discipline, right? So in web dev, full stack meaning like dealing – from the server all the way to what people experience in the browser, right, you know, on the web page. Uh, and, like, then every layer in between from, like, JavaScript to HTML to whatever the fuck the server's doing with the HTTP layer and the stuff behind that and databases. There's, there's all mm -hmm. of this stuff. And, uh, and the number of people who can operate through the whole stack effectively, like the fraction of people in web dev who can do that is very small. Um, and I, and I nine use of them. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the word effectively is doing a lot of heavy lifting there too, right? Because yeah, there yeah. are a lot of people who can like do a little you bit. Can, 
all yeah. the way across. And the thing is, it get a lot of value out of even doing a little bit. You right? can, yeah. yeah. It's, it can be because the and power it, of that iteration loop, right? And yeah, and, and because since, since there's one person doing kind of the whole thing, like so, this is like the advantage that I have in our studio. Like I'm, I'm the guy doing web dev, right? And so I would, you know, I, I think I do a pretty good job. But along any one of the parts of the stack, like if I were to go find mm-hmm. somebody whose job was that thing, they'd crush me because they get to focus on the one thing, mm-hmm. right? But I get to let well, every part of the loop gets to inform every other part of the stack when yeah. I'm building stuff, right? There's not there aren't these communication layers of like trying to figure out how to mesh the stuff that I do know about with stuff I don't know about. Mm-hmm. Like none of that is in there. And I think but Jack of all trades, master of none, better than a master of one yeah. is the full is the full thing, yeah. The uh, full phrase. Yeah. And yeah, so I think yeah, I think in large organizations or something like that. When you just need a lot of <laughs> throughput. Realistically, you're going to go with specialization because that's all. That's the easiest way you're going to hire people. It's the easiest way you can maintain personnel as yeah. with attrition and all this kind of stuff. Because when you're relying on kind of like the full stack model, you're putting also a lot of a lot of pressure on and pressure on, and also uh, uh, as a support structure for your operation on small numbers of individuals. So like loss of an individual is extremely costly. So even though like there's a huge benefit to having that individual, the fact that they could disappear and now you don't have them is like so risky that you're Mm -hmm. often better off, again, from a large organization perspective of focusing on the core disciplines and just actually doing Mm -hmm. this sort of, not treadmill. What's what I'm looking for? The, The factory the thing that's like a treadmill. Conveyor belt. Conveyor belt. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. Like it's a treadmill. Assembly line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A treadmill yeah. with boxes on it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, the, and and the weird thing about that, though, is it's something I've always kind of wondered is even in an organization like that, it's not like it's not like you have a manager who's managing a team of like front end developers and the manager only knows about front end dev and somehow is able to like get like communicate with the person managing the back end team. You know, like I feel like somebody, somebody in there still has to know a shitload about most of the, well, I think most of the stack. I think actually the way you've, you know? you've described it is like perfect example, because like you shouldn't have a team that's just front end and a team that's just back end. But right? you do actually, you though, want, right? What you, what you want is you want a team that, a team that has everybody on it. This is all like a lot yeah. of the idea in Agile too, is like it's, it's a cross-functional team, right? It's so really what you have when you have a, a person, a single person who's able to do a full stack of something. Right. It could be, uh, I don't know, a singer or songwriter who can also produce their own stuff and like knows how to deal with Spotify and SoundCloud or some shit, right? Yeah. Anytime you have someone who can do all of it, all you really have is a whole team smash into one person. Yeah. Right? Which yeah. is it's a whole team without the cost of You got a layer. CPU instead yeah. of a GPU. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but you just and you just don't have to manage the communication layer of all the stuff, right? Which actually yeah. is be a way bigger cost than anybody believes it is. It's where most ever. of the challenges of managing yes. project come into play is, is is like handoffs and accurate communication and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. So not having to do it because it's all within a single One person uh, is extremely advantageous, but it's also very risky. It's a fragile. Yeah. It's a fragile system. Um, but when that person gets their COVID booster, you know, well. The whole company shuts down for three days because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> because they, they got a fever. Uh, yeah. So you know you got to you got to pick your problems. What kind of problems do you want to mm-hmm. do you want to have? Uh, well, I, I guess we some. I think we answered the question somehow. Uh, <laughs> we wandered all over on that one. Uh, yeah, how do you get how do you get in the zone? I think we got there. <laughs> we, we answered it. We're in a zone somewhere. Anyway, point being, st- <laughs> some stuff is hard. <laughs> including answering questions in a concise manner. Jesus. Because so, you have to want to. You know, yeah, issues. Otherwise, it's, otherwise it's hard. And uh, frankly, we don't we don't want to stay on task or answer a question exactly as asked. Yeah. Is know? it hard to answer questions? No. But it is hard to <laughs> be motivated enough mm-hmm. to want to answer the question <laughs> to actually do it. Yeah, so is it, is it difficult now? <laughs> but it is <laughs> hard. Yeah. It's, it's real hard. We've never, we've never succeeded in that endeavor. Uh, <laughs> And that's all the time we have for this week. We'd like to thank our producers, Fat Bard and Sapa DeCosta, for putting the podcast together. Thanks to our community moderators who keep our Discord running. To get more involved in the Butterscotch community, you can go to podcast.bscotch.net, where we have links to the community Discord, a way for you to donate, and links to the podcast archives. And if you haven't yet, head on over to Steam and give Crashlands 2 a wish list, and that will help boost it up the charts, and it'll help us have a successful launch, and we'd appreciate it. So thank you all for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.